The Reluctant Black Hawk by Brenda Zeman. So, you want to find the Indian guy who walked out 30 years ago on the Chicago Blackhawks? Good luck. Freddy Sasakamoose has no phone, nor does he return a phone message passed on to him by his friend, Ray Hennecke. Maybe you think he's had his full of, fill of strangers asking him why he gave up a Canadian boy's dream to play in the National Hockey League. Yet, because you want to understand how it happened, you decide to jump in your car, go look for this Freddy Sasakamoose, track him down. You head north from Saskatoon into Dukabor country, beyond the North Saskatchewan River. In the Lucky Dollar Store at Blaine Lake, a fair-haired woman looks at you, then says, Niet to a baby fussing in a grocery car, cart. North of town, past the Muskeg Lake Reserve sign, you veer northwest. The road is paved and bales of hay and swaths of wheat lie on golden hills set into the blue sky. To your relief, you see people ahead, a road crew. You ask directions, but even the road crew doesn't seem to know the road. About 30 miles, says one fellow. 60 for sure, says another. A third says, better ask at the garage this side of Shell Lake. Seminaires Repair Service and Cafe. The old garage man eyes you curiously when you say you want to go to Sandy Lake. I'm looking for Freddy Sasakamoose, you add. So am I, he says. Why? He owes me, he drawls, his face crinkling into a slow smile. No sign of malice in his tired blue eyes. Three teenage girls stand hitchhiking on a reserve road. You stop and they pile in. They don't know much about Freddy Sasakamoose, one girl says. He used to be chief of Sandy Lake and he used to play for the Sandy Lake Chiefs. That's all you know, you ask? What about the slap shot? What about his ambidexterity? The rink-long rushes? His magic on the ice? The girls are puzzled and they giggle, not knowing what to say. No, they've never heard about Freddy going to Chicago when the NHL only had six teams, or about the time in 1974 when Freddy was in Edmonton making final preparations to take a young Saskatchewan Indian hockey team to Finland. Howie Meeker heard about it and invited Freddy to a Team Canada World Hockey Association practice. Later in the dressing room, Bobby Hull greeted Freddy with, I know who you are. You're the Indian who played with Chicago. You're the beggar with the slap shot I have to lift up to. You drive on in silence, wondering what is beyond the next hill. From the top, you see the center of the reserve, a cluster of buildings just down the road. You breathe a sigh of relief. The name Ataka Coop is everywhere, on the rink, on the school, finally at the entrance to the band office. After the hereditary chief, one girl says, you ask why the, why the name Sasakamus isn't on the rink. But the girls get out saying they don't know. You go in the band office and ask for Freddy Sasakamus, former elected chief of the Ataka Coop Indian Reserve. He's in there, a man points to a door three steps away. At an all-day meeting, he says, only happens once a month. He goes inside to get him. You notice a sign in the office. No long-distance telephone calls. Counselor Freddy Sasakamus emerges from the meeting room. Your eyes meet at the same level. He can't be more than five feet seven inches tall in his Texaco cap, and he's stocky. He doesn't know you from Eve. You tell him you've come to find him, to ask him if he'll tell his story. His black eyes are amused. Oh yeah, he grins. I was going to phone you sometime. You find yourself grinning with Frederick George Sasakamus. I was born December 25th, 1933, over at White, Whitefish Reserve. Now they call it Big River Reserve, just neighbor, neighboringly out from here, about 15 miles from this reserve, Sandy Lake. My mother's father, old Gaspar Morin, lived at Vic, Victor. It used to be a Métis settlement near Whitefish. My grandmother, Morn, was an Indian from Sandy Lake who married out to a Métis. That made my mother Métis too, until she married into a Sandy Lake Indian. My mother's name is Sue Gill. Them days in the 30s, it was tough. My father, Roderick Sasakamus, was into logging. 
Very hardly did I see my old man trap. His father was Alexander Sasaknus, and he married a, a fable. Julia, Julia was my grandmother. Old Alexander must have been into some farming. I remember the time he chased me for jumping on some haystacks. He was mute. He couldn't talk or hear, but he could run, that old man. Caught me too and gave me a good licking. I had a good childhood, real good. It must have been 1937 or 38, I had these bob skates. Old Gasper used to clean up ice for me to skate. It wasn't long till I started making hockey sticks from wet red willows. I'd find a branch, one that was crooked at the end, and chop it off. I'd use any damn thing that I could find for a puck, stones or rocks or cans. Maybe maybe even a frozen apple or two, eh? Trouble was we didn't have too many horses in, in them days, or any good transportation. That was one of, one of the reasons I missed quite a bit of school. I went to school in this area for about a year. What made it tough, I had to walk two and a half miles in the morning and then home again. Five miles in the winter, that was too much for a little guy. When I was about eight years old, my parents sent me to school at St. Michael's over at Duck Lake. Maybe they seen something ahead for me. I don't know. It wasn't too far, only about 60 miles, but it seemed like the end, other end of the world for, for me. I really missed my kids when I had to send them so far away from home. I had 11 kids, but only five lived. I've lost two set of twins, and another boy, and another girl. They all died from illness. I knew Freddie and the others would be well taken care of at the residential school. It was better I send them, because we didn't have no bus, and I didn't want them to get sick. I've sent all my children to school, including Clara, who was five when she left. I never went to school, and my late husband only a little bit. I never learned to read or write at all until my husband showed me how to play bingo. One night I won $2,800. I spent it at the best possible way on household things, and I put the rest in the bank. My mother, her name was Veronica Bear. She raised us really good. My dad, he was Joe Morin. He died when I was about eight. Later, my mother married another Morn, this time Gaspar. Anyway, she raised us alone. She taught us not to steal, not to do anything wrong. In fact, she always used to tell me, Sugal, that's my nickname, my real name is Judith, she'd say, Sugal, if you don't do this right, the cops are going to come and get you. My mother taught us to do a lot of things, to bake bread, to make bannock, to sew, and how to make moccasins. A lot of times, I used to do beadwork. She would rip it out, tell me it wasn't good enough. She would make me do it properly. I guess my mother was right in bringing me up the way she did. I always tried to do the right thing, but sometimes even if you try to do the right thing, things go wrong. One day, three of us ladies decided to go picking berries up north. My friend Alice picked us up in her van. Alice didn't know she had guns in the back. They belonged to her son. After a while, we decided we were going to stay overnight. We didn't know whose place it was, but there was bedding and everything we needed right in the cabin. Next morning, we decided to start picking berries. But the game warden came. He saw the guns in the van, and they charged us $100 for illegal possession. We decided to pay up on the spot because we didn't want to go to court. We didn't want to be in the newspapers. The game warden took our $100 and the guns to the RCMP barracks at Big River. It wasn't until Alice's son wondered where his guns had gone to. We had to tell. Pretty soon everybody knew about it. Now they called us the outlaws. None of my children were outlaws like me. I tried to pass down all the good qualities from my mother. I think Freddie tried to do his best in hockey. I remember my husband and I used to listen to the radio. My husband was a great sportsman in his day, a really good soccer player for this reserve. 
He used to travel all around and he scored lots of goals, just like Freddie did in hockey. Anyway, my husband and I used to listen to the radio. I didn't understand many words, but I used to hear Chicago and Sasakamus, Sasakamus, so I knew Freddie was good. I don't know why he quit. He never talked about it. My husband and I were kind-hearted. We never spoke in anger to each other. We never asked him about it. But I know one thing. The reason he played hockey so well is because his Indian name is Ayakoko Pawiwiyin. My Indian name is Red Thunder Woman. When I hear thunder, I am not afraid. I enjoy it. My youngest son, Leo, was given the name Morningstar. He is calm and quiet. That makes Leo a good golfer. Freddie got his name from Bertha Star Blanket. She's an old woman on this reserve, more than a hundred now. I know Freddie had strong legs for hockey because the old lady named him according to the spirit of a young bull. His Indian name means to stand firm. Maybe three times I tried to run away from St. Michael's School. Once there were three of us boys. We started out in the morning and we hid out until three or four o'clock. It was spring and there used to be a ferry just south of Duck Lake called, called Carlton Ferry. This ferryman wouldn't cross us. He knew we were from that school. He'd delay us, give us something to eat, and he'd grab hold of the phone and call us, call up those priests. Sure enough, in about an hour, the priest would show up and take us back to school. In them days, priests were tough. They shaved our heads and made us sit in the middle of the floor on the cement to embarrass us. All the kids would watch us sitting there, eating, even the girls. We were also punished for speaking Cree at school, whipped sometimes. We did not speak very good, good English at the time, and I still don't. <clears throat> we had a hell of a time trying to communicate in English with our fellow little students. We'd usually talk Cree when we were away from the scene, eh? Today I speak Cree real good. It's what I was born with and I enjoy it. We didn't have no excuse for running away. We were being fed good and were being, being cheat, treated good. In about seven or eight years after the priests and the sister ha sisters had offered me everything into my life, I didn't feel so bad about school. But I wouldn't go back to that kind of system. I guess when you're young like that, you like to come back home. I was lonesome. Come August, I never wanted to go to go back to school, but my parents were determined. They wanted me to to be somebody education-wise. And then there was hockey. Hockey was the main issue for me, and for the priests too. They were they were French, and a lot of them were from down east, eh, from Montreal. They were crazy about hockey. I remember Father Roussel. I believed in a system of obedience. He was just like a Russian trainer. What would happen is that old father Roussel had maybe 50 pucks in the middle of the bloody ice, and if a guy was coasting, not moving on a whistle, father Roussel would fire a puck right at, right at him. Of course, when it gets 20 or 30 below, these pucks would freeze, and in them days, we didn't, we didn't have no padding. padding. Everything was homemade. Maybe just a few sticks here and there in your pants to stop you from getting hit on your Charlie horse. Father Roussel, he taught me to shoot both ways. I started out shooting right, but one, one year he was kind of short on left wing. So he says, who can shoot left? I says, I'll try. Wouldn't you know it? Ends up I'm better shooting left than right. You know, Father Roussel used to say, you're going to hate my guts through the year, year round, <clears throat> you're going to hate it because I'm going to train you hard. Call the extra effort out of you, but at the end of the season, you're going to thank me. And that's what happened. I first met Frederick Sasakamus in September 1944, when he was a student at St. Michael's in Duck Lake. I came there to teach and was in charge at the mission at Batosh across the river. I was also a sports director and in charge of the brass band, too. I was born in Saskatchewan, 12 miles south of St. Wahlberg. My first language is uh, French, eh? 
I started teaching in a country school, and then I went down to St. John's College, which is now part of the University of Alberta. After that, I went one year apprenticeship, Novitate, at the St. Laurent in Manitoba. From there, I went six years to Labrette and then to Duck Lake. As you would know, the Oblates were the first ones to help the Indians to receive some education. It was not the government. We have been criticized for taking them out of their cultural milieu. But we had so little money, and they were so scattered. At the Indian school at Duck Lake, for example, we had students from Muskeg Lake, Mistawasis, Sandy Lake, Montreal Lake, Sturgeon Lake, Fort La Corne, plus the odd one from some other place. From the very beginning, you notice Frederick Sasakamus. He played in the brass band. Uh, trombone or bass, something big to make a lot of noise. He was puffing all right. Sometimes his notes were not correct, but he seemed to enjoy it. He showed more promise on the ice, let's put it this way. Let's acknowledge the gifts that God has given to us. I was quite observant. I could quickly see the strong points and the weak points of my players. As well, I know my strong points and weak points. Frederick was kind of short and stout. He was taller than he was wide, of course, but I would say he was the short, strong type. He had strong legs. He was steady on his skates and had some nice motions, feigning to the right or to the left. I realized that right away. Lots of times when he was a boy, he came to me and said, When I get older, I'll be playing in the NHL. And in his case, I believed it. And I would answer, If you work hard, you will succeed. Do your best and play cleanly. There was only once I had to discipline Frederick, and he learned his lesson. He was playing dirty. He got beat by the other guy who managed to bypass him, so he tripped him, and that was against my regulations. Our reputation as clean hockey players was good, excellent, I would say. No dirty stuff. Ah, there was some checking, but no bulldozing or ramming into the boards. Well, afterwards, all the boys were sitting in the dressing room, and I was maybe eight, ten feet away from Frederick. And I said, this isn't the way to play. And I threw a glove in his direction. Well, I could throw straight enough. Of course, it peeved him. Naturally. He said, if that's the case, I won't play anymore, and you lose the game. I answered, well, I prefer to lose honorably than to win in a shameful way. The next day was a nice day. Usually at noon, I'd give the senior team a hockey practice. When it was warm, everybody outside. Take exercise, run around, shoot, shoot some snowballs, whatever. But get some oxygen to the brain. Frederick stayed in on the first day. On the second day, he was standing by the window so he could see us on the rink. The third day, he came out and he stood along the boards. He was shouting to the boys, Come on, hurry up, get going! Hockey was getting the best of him. When I came in, Frederick was standing firmly in the doorway, blocking my entrance. He said, If you want me to, I'll play. I said, uh, if you want to do what I tell you, okay. If not, no deal. He said, I will. And from that time on, no trouble. He followed my orders from that time on. I believe in conditioning. I used to give the boys gymnastics, bench work, and some mat work. They did a lot of running when the ice was bad, and I had them roller skating in the off-season. When the ice was good, I'd get them out skating. I could skate enough to move ahead. But to make them move, I'd use my hockey stick. A little tap on the seat, not a big one, for the ones who were lagging behind. The boys used to enjoy that. They'd say, hey, look at him, slow poke. Go after him. Shoot the puck at them? No. Well, maybe shoot towards them on the side. I could shoot straight enough. 
As for Frederick's shot, I believe in the wrist shot. Quick, accurate. Fred developed a good, excellent, I would say, wrist shot when he played at St. Michael's. He practiced all the time, even taking practice with the younger boys when I was too busy. I would say Frederick lived for hockey, and so did the other boys on the team. You know, those who say the Russians showed us how to play hockey don't know what they're talking about. In 1948, Joe Primo, he was a scout for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He saw my boys play in a provincial championship game in Weyburn. My boys were like scrubs, so short compared to the Weyburn boys. But we had all but two returning the next year. Joe Prim Primo said to me, Father, your boys don't play as hockey as fast as the professionals, but they play positional hockey. And that was true. Frederick knew what he was doing on the ice by the time he left St. Michael's. He had confidence. The exciting thing about watching Frederick was this. You knew he was going to score. You just didn't know his plan of attack. And that provided the suspense. Maybe when he got to Chicago, he didn't work hard enough. Or yeah, maybe he married too young. I don't think Frederick would mind me saying this. I've been to his house, and he received me well several times. But maybe his heart took him out of the play. In the spring of 1949, we beat Regina and won the Midget Championship of Saskatchewan. Eh? That's when I thanked Father Roussel. That time was something I'll never forget. Of course, the team rode back to school in one of those big damn grain trucks we used to use, squeezing together to keep warm. After that, I came back home and I had no intention of going into junior hockey. None at all. Never had no dream. You just go back home, that's all. Maybe we figured we weren't good enough to go to junior hockey training camp. Our dream was never NHL. Never. <clears throat> I was back here in the fall, about this time of the year. We were streaking over at Blue Huron. My mom and dad and me. It was thrashing time. All of a sudden, a car, car pulled into the field and I thought I seen Father Roussel coming. I thought he was coming to take me back to school and I said to my dad, Oh no, I'm not going back. I'm 15 and I'll be 16 in December and I don't have to go back. Ends up it was Father Chevrier. He was going to be boss at Duck Lake and two other guys. He said, Do you want to go to training camp in Moose Jaw? And I said, Where's that? When he told me, I said, No, I'm not going. No damn way am I going to go to any place now that I'm back home. Then Father Chevrier says, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $50 a month for spending money, and I'll dress you up real good. I still wasn't going to go. I thought he was talking about those old combination overalls the sisters used to make us at Duck Lake. Finally, Mom came over and Dad came over. He says, you have a good offer. After about an hour of co coaxing, my mother demanded that I go, and I gave up. I must have done good in Moose Jaw. I showed up real good. I must have. That's when George Vogan of the Canucks told me to come live with him and his wife and his daughter, Phyllis. Treated me real good, those people. My dad was general manager of the Moose Jaw Canucks. I was 16 at the time. I came home late one night and heard something in the living room. I went upstairs and asked my brother's girlfriend, who was visiting from Michigan where my brother was playing minor pro, I asked her who was in the living room. Phyllis, she said, your father brought home another hockey player, and this time he's an Indian. Just a few days before, the same girl and I had gone to the train station because my father was out of town, and he asked me to go meet Ray Leacock, a defenseman from Montreal. Ray was surprised I spotted him so quickly on the platform. Ray, I said, you're probably the only black guy in Mushta. For sure, you're the only one in a hockey jacket. This was too much for my brother's girlfriend. First Ray, 
Then an Indian fellow. She was an American, eh? You better get used to it, I told her. That's the way we do things in this house. I got up the next morning, and there was Freddy. He had on a pair of really heavy plaid pants and a thick plaid shirt and a cap pulled down over his ears, and he was very, very dark-skinned. Before the year was out, he was as light as I am. Anyway, there he sat, just looking terrified, about like Metro Price Stack, who looked when he came over to live with us about seven years before. Freddie had never seen plumbing, so that night I told Dad, you better take him up and show him how to use the bathtub. We'd done that with Metro. So Dad took him up. Freddie's mom had made him black silk shorts, and that's how Dad left him in the bathroom. Freddie was in there for about an hour and a half. Finally, I said, Dad, you better go see what he's doing in there. Dad went, and there was Freddie sitting in an empty tub in his black silk shorts. But Freddie learned very quickly. He was really bright. He was a, such a beautiful handwriter. He used to write Frederick Sakamus over everything, sheets, tablecloths, you name it. Until one day I said, Freddie, I don't care if you're practicing your autograph, but this has to stop. The other thing I was really impressed with was Freddie's reflexes. He used to catch our budgie out of the air as it flew past him, and he could throw five pennies in the air and catch them before they hit the floor. Freddie wasn't the first Indian person to live with us. One day in about uh, 1943, Dad showed up at the house with an American Indian. Dad ran into Chief Iktomi in Fur Mountain. The chief had about six university degrees, and he was going around doing a book on North American Indians until his tires went flat at Fur Mountain. Tires were hard to come by during the war, so Dad offered to help him get some new tires. Ended up, the chief moved in with us, and Metro and eight other hockey players stayed with us for six months. Freddie lived with us for four years, three years with Mom and Dad, and when my husband and I got married, he moved in with us next door for a year. Freddie couldn't have lived with just anybody in those days. He needed to be looked after in lots of ways. He was so honest, he'd always pay up what he owed at Doherty's Pool Hall. Once he came home and said, Phil, I lost a hundred dollars, and I paid up, but there's two guys owe me more than that, and they won't pay me. They're orderlies from the hospital, and I so I had to call up Mother Supervisor. She forced them to pay up. Money literally flew by Freddie. I remember after he went up to Chicago for a few games in the spring of 53. He came home with a big check, and he wasn't supposed to cash it till he got to Saskatchewan. When he got there, almost the first thing he showed me was a big photo of a beautiful Indian model. I think he said she was Cherokee. He'd met her in Chicago. She was modeling something pretty scanty in the photo, I thought. Oh boy, Freddy, you may be in the big leagues, but this girl is out of your league. When Freddy lived with us, hockey was his life. He socialized with the rest of the team, but always as a part of the group. You know, everybody going out and having a good time together. I remember he used to correspond with an Indian girl named Rose, a nursing student, I think, an Icebester girl named Loretta came from up north. But he rarely saw them, and it was more of a friendship thing. Still, this girl from Chicago was supposed to have him running around missing practices. Anyway, next day after Freddie got to Moose Jaw, he was out and bought a car with the cash he had on him. He still had his check when he headed off to Humboldt to see Rose. He didn't make it. I got a frantic call. Well, about as frantic as Freddie ever got. Phil, he said, my tire went flat, and when I was changing the tire, the wind came along and blew my check away. What am I going to do, Phil, he said. Dad phoned Chicago right away to put a stop payment on the check and I phoned the mailbag on CHAB Moose Jaw to tell people to be on the lookout for a Chicago Blackhawk check made out to Fred, Frederick Sakamoose. Wouldn't you know it, a farmer found it in his field and called up the radio station. I called Freddie and he said, But Phil, I gotta go see Rose. I said, Freddie, you go get that check and thank the man for his trouble. He went, but that was Freddie. He lived for the moment. 
Haven't seen Freddy since he was on his way to see Rose, but I remember getting a Christmas card and him telling me he named his oldest daughter Phyllis after me and his oldest son Elgin after a friend of his in Moose Jaw. Freddy was happy here. He was part of our family. When he left for Chicago, I said to Tiny Thompson, the scout, I said, Tiny, they won't care about Freddy in Chicago the way we care about him here. The year I went to Chicago, we lost out in junior hockey to Regina or somebody. I was in the Canuck training dressing room taking my stuff off. Nobody was talking. We were sad about being taken out. I was thinking about going home. First person I seen was George Vogan. That man and his fa family offered me everything. He was just like my dad, and my dad was a good man. George walked towards me. He had a suitcase. I said, George, what's this? He said, didn't you hear the good news? I said, nobody ever told me anything yet. Well, he didn't tell me. He just kind of looked around a little bit at the coach and the manager. All of a sudden, the manager, manager came up to me and he said, here's a telex. Here's your plane ticket. You're going to Chicago, Black, for Chicago Blackhawks for the remainder of the season. So I didn't know what to do. I just stood there and I looked at the players. They were astonished, me being an Indian, to be called and go play in the big leagues. Then people walked in there with the watch, my name engraved, and a ring, two suitcases filled with clothes, so I looked respectable, respectable on my way in. It was a real joy. I was the first guy to go from the Vogans to the NHL. I was a lot like Freddie. Moose Jaw flabbergasted me, such a big place, and radios and indoor toilets. I thought I was in heaven. In Yorkton, we had a crystal set, and when nature called, we just ran 100 feet from the house to the biffy. My mother and father didn't speak much English. So my mother said in Ukrainian, By metro, you can go to Moose Jaw. If he goes to school, he goes to church, and he doesn't get paid much to play hockey. She didn't need to worry about me being a good boy. Instead of going to the pool hall, I go skating every night. It was indoors, and it was free. I was gone from Moose Jaw by the time Freddie moved in with the Vogans. I was 19, and I went up to Chicago in 1947. A couple of years later, George Vogan started telling me about this great kid, Sakamus. What a hell of a hockey player. He was, and I started seeing him in the spring when I drive from Chicago to Saskatchewan with Doug Bentley. I took the plane the next day. i never been on a plane before. I met the team in Toronto. Some of the people from Ustra followed me too. They wanted to see me play. I got in the dressing room and they gave me number 16 and I didn't know, know what the heck to do. Anyway, I got onto the ice, and I was skating around warming up. At that time, I was just like, uh, I'm not bragging, but I could skate and skate and shoot real good. I had my slap shot by then. I don't know where it came from. I don't know where I seen it. Nobody was using it much then. It just came natural to, natural to me. I took a shot or two, and a referee came up to me and says, Somebody wants to talk to you on the phone. I went over to the penalty box and some guy said over the phone, How the hell do you pr pronounce your damn name? Saskatchewan Moose? Sakamoose? Saskamoose? I said, Who am I talking to? And the voice said, Foster Hewitt. My gosh, I said, Foster. You know, I heard so much about Foster. Back home and at school, we used to listen to Saturday Night Hockey all the time. So I was talking to Foster and I gave him my name properly. Sasakamus. And I guess that's how he he done it. Being the professional he was. I was in the big time now. I had been traded to Detroit by the time Freddie went up to Chicago. Chicago wasn't doing that well at the time, and Freddie was supposed to be the savior. Since he'd done so well in amateur hockey, he was supposed to pick up the franchise. And of course, manager made a big valley who about him being the first treaty Indian to make the NHL. They wanted Freddie to fill the Chicago stadium. I know Freddie 
must have been afraid when he first went up. I know I was. He had to contend with jumping right from junior to NHL, and he had to contend with Chicago, and that was scary. you got to remember, Al Capone died in prison just from syphilis the year before I went to Chicago. And when Freddie had to contend with living at the Midwest Athletics Club, we all did. I had to live there too when I played with Chicago. They call it a hotel, but really it was a dive. They had a place downstairs where gamblers used to hang out. It was a boxing club. I remember one fight under the name, one guy fought under the name of Ruddy Valentino. And all these hoodlums used to sit at ringside in their white and black fedoras. The gangsters used to feel sorry for us poor hockey players. They used to tell us they could get us jobs paying a lot more. But it, I wasn't going to carry a gat like those guys. The biggest gangster I ever ran into at the Midwest was Marty Capone, Al's younger brother. Once, when I was playing for Detroit, Marty was in the crowd. I tried to avoid skating in his corner of the rink, but he kept calling me over. I was afraid to go, and I was afraid not to. Finally, I went, and he said, real tough like, Hey, Metro, get me an autograph stick. I got him an autograph stick. I remember Detroit playing a home-and-home -home series with Sh Chicago shortly after Freddie cracked the lineup. There had been a lot of publicity, and when Freddie came out, there was a big cheer. I was glad I wasn't playing defense or goal against him. He had a very hard, accurate slap shot, and his wrist shot, well, he could get that away with nothing. A lot of guys would have to wind up, but not Freddie. He had tremendous wrists. He could be falling down and still get a good shot away. And he could skate. He could start and stop on a dime. And he could hit top speed in two, maybe three strides. He had the best reflexes I had ever seen, better than Gordie Howe. It's hard to know why I lost it and he didn't. But I know one thing. If he had been with a better organization, maybe like Toronto or Montreal or Detroit, they could have afforded to bring him along more slowly. They could have groomed him better. Chicago's general manager, Bill Tobin, wasn't the hockey man that Con Smythe, Frank Selke, or Jack Adams were. Freddie was most likely with the wrong organization. I remember, though, when I was with Chicago, we used to joke in the dressing room about Doug Bentley. He sort of had a big nose, eh? Nothing against it at all, but we used to tease him about being the only Blackhawk with a picture of himself on the front of the sweater. Then we'd say, when Freddie Sasakamus comes up, he'll be the real thing. Doug used to laugh. He kind of enjoyed it. I don't know how how in the hell I ever come to a, to have a crest like that one. Me being a Treaty Indian and playing for Chicago Blackhawks. Chicago was really something. It kind of helped me along with city life, having lived in Moose Jaw. In Chicago, you were just like another Joe walking down the street. In Moose Jaw, you knew you knew who you were. Freddie Sasak Moose. But in Chicago, nobody knew you. I guess some of the hockey people knew me. When I played my first game in Chicago, I, I ended up on TV and they gave me a transistor radio and a box of cigars. That night, about 19,000 people come and see, come and see the Indian play. And when I first walked in, the organist started playing the Indian love call. He was kind of a comical fella. In Chicago, I stayed in a hotel, and I used to have a friend who roomed with me called Jerry Topazini. He used to take me all over. Once he took me to shake hands with Louis Armstrong. Another time, I, re I remember standing in the doorway talking with Jack Dempsey in his restaurant in New York. I just don't know, know about it. I met some of the great ones. When I come back after playing for those first two months, I had a little bit of money, about seven, $8,000. When I turned pro, they gave me 3000 and I had to sign the C-form to be affiliated with Chicago. Maybe it was 10000 I don't know. It was so damn long ago. Then they gave me the day wages of that time, about 150 a day, plus room and board. I come back home that spring after I turned pro. I bought a car, 
I never owned no car. I used to take cabs. I bought a big DeSoto, a fluid drive, and everybody knew I was back. You should have seen when I walked into this reserve when I come from Chicago when I was 19. It was just like I was out of this world. People looked at you, amazed. It was a wonderful feeling. It's something I have to thank the Creator for, my younger life. Jesus, I was called from all over to play exhibition games, $100 a game. There was still ice in Saskatchewan, and every place I went was filled. I was young, and I was single, and every, everyone wanted to see me play. I thought it was pretty good of Freddie to come and see me. Little Loretta Eisbesser from Bodmin, when he could have had almost anybody, eh? We kind of got together through my brothers. They had this thing about Freddie. Whenever he played hockey, they wanted to go see him because he was such a good player. We lived out in the sticks, and my dad farmed mixed farming. My mother was from Sandy Lake Reserve till she married my dad, Miles Eisbester. He's made tea, you know. Then automatically, she was classified as non-Indian. In her heart, she was always Indian, and to us. We classified ourselves as Indian, too, because there's not much difference between Métis and Indian. My mother died when I was 14, which was a tragic for all of us. From then on, I raised my youngest six brothers and sisters. There was no one else to do it. I was young, but you know you grow pretty fast when you have to. I was 16 when I met Freddie. He was 18. I think there was quite a bit of difference there. I was kind of tied up at home, whereas he was from one city to another, seeing all those places. But we hit it off real good as friends, and he'd write letters to me, send me Christmas presents, Valentine's cards, this and that. My brothers were really happy when I married Freddie, four years later. But I don't know about my dad. Well, you know, most dads have things about trying to hang on to their little girl for as long as they can. I had raised my family. And probably they hated to see me go. Leaving them behind, I sort of felt like I was neglecting them. And finally, my dad said, You did your share for this long, and it's fine. But I still had that feeling. The thought of going to Chicago was a bit much. I don't know much about big cities, and at this time, I don't know anything about big cities. There's a lot of good things about people here. They tend to be a little backward, a little shy. You can't just say, I'll make a friend here, I'll make a friend there. It just wasn't in me. You know, I even had a hard time moving from the south end of Sandy Lake to the north end when we built this new log house, the old house, that was where we raised our nine children, where Freddie started farming, We had and we had three buses. He started getting machinery little by little, and now, <laughs> don't ask me how many acres he's farming, after we moved here, I'd find myself going back to the old house two or three times a day, and it's only seven or eight miles away. I even spent a couple of nights there last year. I had a very good sleep. But now, we've been here better than a year, and I like it now. This is the place we'll raise our second family as long as our son-in-law wants us to. Our oldest daughter passed away, you know, three years ago. Oh, it is so hard on all of us, especially on Freddie. Now we have three children to remember her by. The only time I've ever been away was when I lived for three years with Freddie in Kamloops. I read and I read and I read when I was alone during the day. At night, there were times we'd sit together and Freddie would say, It's so lonely, Loretta. I'll be glad when the hockey season is over. I was in the 55 Chicago training camp in Welland, and I was expecting some letters from Lorette. We'd just been married July 22nd that summer. Every day I looked and there was nothing. I kept on wondering about my old lady and what was going to be become of her. I'd phone her. Of course, we had no telephone, so I'd have to phone a store. Somehow or other, I, go, I couldn't get, a, get her on a phone. After about 20 days, I got worried. What the hell am I going to do? and I was just doing so good in training camp. About 10 days before 30-day camp was over, I got a hold, of, a hold of my wife. I said, I'm going to make the team. Lorette, now you got to come over here. 
I got a house already. I'm making good money. She held back. She didn't want to come. She told me no. Well, then it was a problem. I had to talk to the management, Tommy Ivan. I said, Tommy, I'm having a heck of a time with my old lady. She don't want to come to Chicago. Is there by any chance you could send me to Western Canada? Some place that could be close to my wife, some place she'd enjoy? That's when I went to New Westminster to play for the Royals. Then Kenny was the, Kenny McKenzie was the manager. I said, Kenny, I gotta go for my wife. I want a couple of plane tickets. Give me a couple of days and I'll be back in three or four. Away I went. Got over to Saskatoon Airport. Phoned a taxi nearby, nearby here in Debden and said, Rainy, come and pick me up. So we came and a couple, three hours later, we got we got back here about 6, 7 in the morning, and it was a little daylight. Got to Lorette's dad's house, everybody's sleeping, and I was yelling from the outside. Knocked on the, knocked on the door, nobody answered, so I went upstairs. Lorette opened the door a little, she knew it was me. She said, what do you want? I said, open the door, I want to talk to you. She didn't tell anybody about that. I guess she never will, but I'm glad... I could be able to tell a little bit about it. Anyways, old Miles, my father-in-law, was happy to see me, the old fella. Sat down and had a little breakfast and coffee. Meanwhile, Rainey's waiting for me in the taxi outside. After a little while, I said, Lorette, I got a couple tickets here. Want to take you back, got a good house, making a good living. About another year or so, we'll go back to Chicago and continue playing NHL. And she said no. I don't know what she thought at that time still don't so I went back and seen mom and dad and I told them to told them the problems they said well it's best that you go back you got a good life and good future ahead of you you're young you done what you wanted to do wanted to do for the best of her she didn't want to come so I went back I moved to New Westminster to Calgary to Chicoutimi Quebec League bouncing all over the damn place I guess maybe it was a little bit out of control that was a problem, not using alcohol, not using anything. Just that I kind of fell apart because she wouldn't come with me. My wife was a beautiful gr beautiful girl, and I loved her very much. Two years after, I went back to Calgary, and I was playing in Saskatoon in that old Western Pro League. And my mom and dad were there, and a few people from my reserve and some Indians in Saskatoon came to watch me to play. My mother brought me a beaded jacket, a real beautiful jacket she made for me. My parents were real proud of me, eh? Real proud. During the hockey game, I was kind of looking around where all the Indians were sitting, trying to see my wife. Didn't see her, no place. After the game, I asked my mom where Lorette was. My mom didn't know why she didn't come. After, I went back to the hotel. She decided I was going to go. I was going to quit, quit right then, pack my gear and go home. I was still affili affiliated with the Blackhawks. Anything they say I had to do. So I knew this was the end of me, of my playing NHL. The end of my younger life. I played this bush league in De Debden for a couple of years and I lived with Lorette. Then I got a call from Kenny McKenzie in Kamloops. Double A senior. I got to know the people at the Kamloops yeah. Indian Reserve. Lorette was with me. And I could still play a little bit of good hockey. I first met Freddie in 1957 when he came to Kamloops to play for the Kamloops Chiefs. Before the hockey season was over, I married his brother Peter. My reserve, Kamloops Reserve, is situated right across the river from the city of Kamloops. Kamloops comes from the interior Salish word meaning meeting of the rivers, and we had a population of about 300 at that time. People were very impressed by Freddie when he came out there. At first we saw him as a star. We had some real different ideas about him. We didn't think of him as quite human. People were a little bit distant and hesitant to come up to him and be friendly and talk to him. They held him in awe. To Indian people, he was the equivalent of Elvis Presley as a celebrity. He was an idol, yet he was a role model for young people. Indian people from all around brought season tickets and filled up a whole section of the Kamloops Arena. 
To this day, he is the only person from the plains who has ever been made honorary chief of Kamloops Indian Reserve. My band hosted a traditional ceremony. They had dancers come from the Shuswap nations next to our reserve, and from the Thompsons, the Okanagans, and the fringes of the Chilcotin tribes. They went up on top of Mount Paul and sent signals to all of the tribal groups, and they gathered and honored him. My people named him Chief Thunderstick, because Freddy was very famous for his slap shot. I'd say I was famous in Indian eyes, I was famous. It was a great disappointment that I had given them. I imagine I did. Even the white people in Canwood and Devon were disappointed I was not playing in the NHL. Even them, they knew me. But it was more so for my parents because they saw the great things in life for me. The people on this reserve, they treated me real good when I came back. I knew their life, how the world was, and how they made their living. Of course, I had to learn how to live on the outside but I didn't want to force that way of life on Indian people. I think you have to leave the Indian people, how they enjoy life, how they enjoy themselves, leave that alone. I adjust myself real good. Not once did I leave this reserve since I come back. Although there's a brighter future on the, in, on the outside, there's freedom here. You see, when you, you were playing hockey, you never were free. You were more or less looked at, told what to do. That's part of life as a professional, and you're paid well for it. When I turned pro, I knew damn well I was dressed good. I'd be able to get the things I want. Every two weeks, I was getting paid, and I was getting wiser. I was 21, 22 at the time, and I thought, God damn, I'm going to make it, and I'm going to go through the life of being, being in the NHL. God, it was good. A lot of times, I sat down and asked myself, what went, what, what went wrong with my hockey life? I do not blame it to my wife. I do not blame anybody. Maybe there were some things I could not adjust to. The only thing, it makes a guy kind of wonder what he could have done with some of the big contracts today. After Peter and I lived for a time at Sandy Lake, I got to know Freddie as a person. He has a lot of self-confidence. He's sur a survivor. He's also a bit of a trendsetter. You should see his new log house. He's outgoing, he's musical, he plays guitar and sings, and he can really dance. Freddie's a good person to have at a party. People crowd around him because he's energetic, and he's a good storyteller. Freddie can talk to down and outers, drunks, and he can also talk to the Prime Minister of Canada. Now that I'm band administrator for Sandy Lake, I get the opportunity to see Freddie in a different light. I'm the first woman to ever hold this office, and most people here really felt, you know, me coming from a matrilineal society such as the Interior Salish, and this being a very male-oriented society at Sandy Lake. Well, they had a hard time adjusting to me. I always thought in terms of women, children, and men, the total community, whereas the men tended to think more of what the men wanted to do. The women here are quite silent compared to me. The men often said, that Muriel, she's a woman's liver, and a lot of flack came from my brother-in-law, Freddie. Freddie and I realized our differences right away. Freddie tends to be a bleeding heart, and he believes every sob story that comes his way. Freddie's a dreamer. I am most often a realist, and I sort of say, give him a swift kick in the ass, and that's the direction they should go. But Freddie and I both believe in the community and the betterment of Indian people, and see that change has to take place. I admire Freddie very much. You gotta remember, when he first got into hockey, Sandy Lake didn't have roads, telephones, or electricity, and there were only two vehicles on this reserve. The only things he really knew were trapping, hunting, farming, and hockey. To go from here to Chicago, that's a big jump, and he did it. I really think if he wasn't so tied to his family and his community, he would probably have stayed longer. But it doesn't matter. Freddie gave us all something to be very proud of, but he really talks about it. Freddie doesn't live in the past. If I was to die today, I wouldn't cry for my life. I've met a lot of good people, a lot of good Indians, and a lot of good white people. The, en the enemies I created through my hockey life, the fans that called me names, you know, every one of them came back. I know every one of them. I hear them when I'm on the ice, you know, you're an Indian and this and that, but, you know, I've, I never looked. It never hurted me because I always had pride in me. Enemies from that time come up now and shake hands with me and say, Remember when I used to call you names? 
I don't know, I, I say. Did you? Well, I say, that's gone. Now I meet people who say, any of your children as good as you were? I don't think so, I say. People look at me and I think I should be able to pr produce all good hockey players. But I never, never did go out there with my kids and support them by training them. I lost my oldest daughter three years ago when I was chief. I knew that my daughter was killed in a car accident due to alcohol. At that time, I too was drinking, but not heavy. I was chief. I knew it hurt my life and hurt my family also. So I very seldom, seldom used alcohol. I was blessed with a good wife. She never drank. She's a beautiful woman. She took care of my children when I was not always there. I'm blessed. Funny thing, I didn't know till I was almost 50 when I lost my daughter. It changed me. Now I'm 52, almost 53. I'm a community, community man. I was chief for four years and served my people well. I believe in the system of com competition with the outside white society. When I was a kid, I learned to compete with the outside and I had to be able to do things twice as good to continue to play hockey with them. But the thing I remember is coming home from school every summer. Eh? It was wonderful when we come on the top of that hill over there. We used to drive up in that big three-ton grain truck, you know, 50 or 60 of us piled in there. About six, seven miles south of here, I could see the hill and at the top, oh boy, what a feeling to see this reserve.